Welcome to the Moss Report with your host, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. So this is Ralph Moss, and today we have the great honor of talking to Dr. Thomas N. Seyfried, who is professor of biology at Boston College. Uh, Professor Seyfried received his PhD in genetics and biochemistry from the University of Illinois in Urbana, I guess we pronounce it, in 1976. He's best known for his work with um, metabolism and ketosis uh, and how it that intersects with diet and illnesses such as epilepsy and, of course, cancer. Uh, Professor Seyfried is the author of about 200 peer-reviewed articles uh, listed in PubMed, and about half of those specifically concern cancer. So, Professor Seyfried, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks very much, Ralph. It's uh, it's it's nice to to be here. So, you remember that I came and I visited you uh, in Boston, um, Chestnut Hill, I guess it is, uh, uh, at your lab in. Um, well, it must have been about eight years ago, and wow. um, the the occasion of that was your publication of your book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. And I've had a chance to read that book many times. I, I mean, I, I've referenced it so many times in my own writing, and looking at it again in preparation for this discussion, I really must say that I think that this is one of the most revolutionary works that has ever been published in the cancer field. Uh, offhand, I can't think of many other books, and I am a student of the history of cancer and of cancer research, and not too many that really go to the root, to use the word, the original origin of the word radical, and go to the root of the problem and really try to globally change thinking about this disease. So I, and I think the book has stood up very well over the past 10 years. Um, in your book, you make some, what I would say would be surprising, even astonishing statements about cancer. And so I want to ask you about these and give you a chance to explain them because they're going to sound odd to or, or contradictory to a lot of our listeners. Um, they, uh, they are, the some t- cases, the diametrical opposite of the so-called conventional wisdom on cancer. But I think people will really enjoy hearing um, from the expert on you know what th- what this means and why uh, why you've come to these views after uh, almost uh, forty years in the field. Um, and and if possible, of course, try to put it in language that lay people can understand, because that's our our audience is for the the person who's dealing with cancer, who's ser- seriously interested in understanding the the basis of this disease and its possible cure. So my my first the first thing that you say that strikes me as being um, uh, new to most people is the idea that. Some, if not most, conventional anti-cancer agents largely operate through reduced caloric intake. This is a, a strange notion to most people. Could you explain what you mean by that? Well, um, I can't be sure whether all conventional treatments work through that process, but uh, the concept came to me, I'm working with Dr. Perna Mukherjee, who who got her PhD in calorie restriction, and she and I have been working together on this problem for uh, 20 years, uh, at least. And and um, when we were doing some original work from uh, with a drug uh, called N-butyl um, deoxynogermycin, you know, it doesn't make any difference what the name of it is, but it it was supposed to stop gangliocide biosynthesis. And um, which are complex glycolipids, you hear a lot about that from Tay Sachs disease. But cancer cells have 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 a, have um, abnormalities in, in these gangliosides. And I got my my PhD in gangliocide biochemistry. 
So we had a drug that blocked gangliocide biosynthesis. Uh, a, a drug com- a company, pharmaceutical company, had given us this drug to to look look at changes in gangliosides. And when we put it on, I don't. We, we we do things. You know, we put it on some mice that had some tumors. We were looking at other things besides looking at Tay Sachs disease and things like this. But we had some tumors growing in the lab, and we put the we gave this drug to the animals and um it shrunk the tumors tremendously and of course the drug company got very very excited about this as well as inhibiting gangliocide biosynthesis um so obviously it looked as though we have a drug that would stop gangliocide biosynthesis and at the same time uh shrink the tumor well this became you know a, a massively interesting drug to this company and they had ideas of patenting this drug and doing all this kind of stuff. And then uh, Perna and a couple of other people said, well, you know, you got to be careful about some of these drugs because um, if, if, if the drug is working through a unique mechanism like targeting gangliocide biosynthesis, you have to be sure that the drug isn't also influencing some uh, uh, external event, something outside what you think it might be. Um, like maybe, so, uh, we, we were watching the mice, you know, it was very interesting. They were eating, we had to mix the, the drug in with a powdered chow and they were eating the powdered chow at the same level as the uh, control group that did not get the drug. Uh, but they were losing body weight. And I said, wow, this is interesting. The animals eating the drug were losing body weight. And I said to Pern, I says, do you think the, 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 the therapeutic benefit of this drug is, is not through inhibition of gangliocide biosynthesis, but rather through an inhibition of body weight. In other words, the drug was acting like something that would reduce calorie. And we put another group of mice in after we saw this um, phenomenon, we put another group, a control group of mice in that did not get the drug, but we took food away from them so that their body weight matched exactly that of the, of the group that was getting, was uh-huh. getting the drug. And uh, what we found is the tumor shrunk to the exact same size uh, as the animals that were getting the drug and were losing body weight. And then when we looked at the gangliocide composition, of course, the gangliocide composition was significantly reduced in the drug group, but wasn't reduced at all in the, in, in the calorically restricted group. So uh, consequently, the drug had, uh, yes, it was inhibiting gangliocide biosynthesis, but, it had no, but the inhibition of gangliocide biosynthesis had nothing to do with the therapeutic benefit of why the drug shrunk the tumor. The oh. dr- and then we later, we later found out that the, that the drug bo- blocked sucrase activity in, in the intestines. And what was happening, the mice were eating this food, but they weren't able to digest the food. So it was like an indirect calorie restriction. And then we went on and looked at many of the other drugs in, that are being used in pharmaceutical, like temozolomide. Well, you know, we gave mice temozolomide and um, yeah, it killed the tumor, but they shrunk that it also caused massive body weight. As a matter of fact, we couldn't starve mice enough to, to lose body weight as fast as temozolomide worked. So tem- temozolomide, which is used in the, in the glioblastoma brain cancer yes. field quite a bit, um, it seemed to increase basal metabolic rate. So even if it, our control mice, if I took the, all the food away from them, they could not drop body weight as fast as the group that was getting the temozolomide. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so what, what I'm thinking, in fact, indirect calorie restriction is one of the mechanisms which we think is responsible for some, not all, of course, for some of the therapeutic benefits of some of these drugs. So, um, so why, why give drugs? Now, we don't need to do this anymore because um, we now know that all cancers rely on glucose and glutamine for growth. And all we need to do is, is restrict glucose and glutamine. Uh, we restrict, um, and this will kill the majority of cancer cells because they're one disease. It's all, all cancers are the same and they can't live without fermentation mechanisms. So when you calorie restrict, you're shutting down glucose availability, which is shutting down their, their glycolytic uh, fermentation process. Yeah, and we'll, get into, it, we'll get into that. Um, but I'm just saying, you know, the yeah. bottom line is, is that you're absolutely right. I, I can't be sure how many successful cancer therapy therapeutic drugs are working in part through indirect calorie restriction but i wouldn't be surprised if many of them do i recently uh, spoke to a patient uh who was who had a, a glioblastoma uh brain cancer 
and was taking uh, Temidar or tem Temozolabide is the scientific name. And he was losing weight. And it, 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 and it was strange because I didn't know this, what you just, what you just said. I was trying to figure out, was this person in cachexia? Was he, you know, in kind of a, a, a free fall in terms of yeah. his, his weight? But perhaps now I know something about that drug, about Tevedor, that it could actually, the drug itself could be causing that, that weight loss. And you say that, that that alone is a kind of anti-cancer agent, but of course you can't starve yourself to death. <laughs> Are you going to, I mean, even if a person stopped eating and, and there have been over the, over the years, and in fact, I'd say over the, over the decades, attempts made to kill cancer by, by basically by water fasting. But at a certain point, you kill the person by, by doing that. Right. No. And so that's not no, a I, strategy. I, I, you know? I, I, you have to you have to do it the right way. You know, there's a uh, guy Tannenbaum. He's all over the web. Um, he had advanced prostate cancer. He, mm -hmm. he's, he has a lot of uh, things on the web now. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had he had like you. He had come to my office, and he was in a 20 day. Fa he came with his son, so he had already been on a 20 day water only fast. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, I talk about this stuff, but I don't often meet people who are actually doing it. Yeah. <laughs> or actually yeah. sitting in my office who haven't eaten for 20 days. Yes. Um, but he, he had, he was diagnosed. He has a, he's, he, he's a French, he speaks French. He has English and French, uh, productions on the web. And he wanted to let me know that he just did a series of 20 day water only fasts. Uh, of course, in between time, he was eating small amounts of very highly nutritious foods, but then he would go on these 20 day fasts and he lost, he went from 130 a correction, 230 pounds down to it. When I saw him, he was like 160. He looked great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he had advanced uh, metastatic cancer into the bones and, and you know, where, where prostate mm -hmm. cancer goes. Mm -hmm. And now he's completely without cancer. And you know, the strange thing um, that he always asked me, he said, when he went back to the oncologist, the oncologist never really asked him, what are you doing? It was like, well, of course. I mean, here's a guy, he should be, right? He should be dead. And, and you think the, the oncologist said, well, what do you, and then he says, I'm, 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 I'm doing water only fasting. And the oncologist said, well, I would continue to do that if I were you. <laughs> so you, you can, you can see now I have to be honest with you. Um, uh, you know, this is pretty, pretty draconian way to get rid of cancer, but this guy is, you know, eating now healthy vegetables and all he's on the web. And my other a friend, JJ Tracon from France, he, he was, uh, he has a book coming out also JJ Tracon battling uh, advanced metastatic kidney cancer. And um, his battle was horrific. Um, he's the only pilot in, in air. He's a pilot. Air France flies the big jets. And he's one of the only one, the only person to get his uh, license back after suffering advanced metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And he, he managed his cancer using um, ketogenic diets with a water only therapeutic fasting. And um, primarily a non a non pharmacol non pharmacological approach, but you know it's very hard to bite the bullet and, and do these kinds of things. You know our research is designed to adapt some of this um, with specific drugs in our press pulse uh, strategy, so we can manage these cancers without without as much um, you know food restriction as some of these other folks have done. But, you know, uh -huh. the bottom line, is the tumor cells need the glucose to survive. And these water only therapeutic fasts are, are really pulling the glucose down um, and starving out these these tumor cells. They can't compete with normal cells when you put the whole body under a, a stressful condition. The issue is so the what, glutamine. And we're working on yes, that now. I was going to say that. So cancers, um, we know that about 90 percent of cancers will light up on a PET scan uh, because presumably because the FDG that's uh, injected into them is a kind of quote unquote non-digestible form of glucose of sugar right and so right. you can right. see where the cancer is because after about an hour the um, the FDG contrast agent starts to accumulate in the areas that crave or they're avid for yeah. glucose but so, so I guess in the naive view, uh, the view that I probably had before I read your book, um, 
it, you would think that um, if you just deprive a person, deprive the body of glucose, that you would then kill off 90% of cancers. But it seems like it's more complicated than that because there are other sources of nutrition. If the cancer is deprived of the glucose, or even if it's not, I mean, it could still be using the most abundant free amino acid in the body, which is glutamine, and perhaps other things as well. So this is sort of the crux of the matter. If you if you get rid of the, theoretically, if you get rid of the glucose, or at least bring it down to a, a level that d doesn't feed the cancer, um, what do you do about the glutamine? Well, the glutamine, we, we can target that. There are drugs that have that are working on glutamine. We use the, the drug uh, Don, Dor, uh, uh, um, uh, noraleucine. It's a glutamine analog. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it shuts down the ability of the cells to use, uh, to use glutamine. It's a panglutaminase inhibitor. Um, mm -hmm. People have used that drug in the past alone. Um, and, and what happens is you get some, some responses that are really good and other responses that are really bad, but they never shut the glucose down when they use the done. So, mm -hmm. so we published a big paper just, just last year showing how if you, if you use a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet to shut down the, gly the glycolysis pathway and then include the don. You slaughter these cancer cells. That you, ha you have to realize glutamine is metabolized to glutamate, to alpha-ketoglutarate. There is no energy involved in the use of glutamine. Glutamine is generating energy in the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, at the succinyl-CoA ligase step. It's a fermentation mechanism because all cancer cells have defective oxidative phosphorylation. We've, we've shown this. Others have shown this. Um, you have to look under the electron microscope to see this, but when you do in tissue preparations. Um, so when and, and all other amino acids, it's like you said, maybe another amino acid, but every other amino acid needs to use energy to metabolize its core structure to alpha ketoglutarate, which is the, which is the key precursor for mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. Um, so here's the situation. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body. It's a mm -hmm. pure gold. It's pure gold to a metastatic cancer cell. So one of the characteristics of metastasis and cachexia, you get a lot of cachexia. Muscles start wasting away. The muscles are a great source of glutamine. So the cancer elicit, elicits the glutamine out of the muscles, and the patients, you know, they eat food that looks like they're wasting away because the yes. cancer is sucking down the glutamine. So in order to manage cancer, you have to do two things. You've got to shut down the glu the glycolysis, the glu the glucose availability. And you have to take away the glutamine. So when you do a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, you lower blood sugar. And don't forget, the ketones are toxic to the tumor cells. So they're not only an alternative source of energy for the brain and, and heart and other organs. They're actually toxic to the tumor cells. But the normal cells uh, thrive on ketones. So you're, you're then shifting the body over to a completely new metabolic state. And then you come in with these glutamine inhibitors and you blast the hell out of these tumor cells without toxicity to the rest of the body. It's not that well, complicated. All you have to know is the biology of the problem. But the drug, the Don that you talk about, I mean, I know you use that in your experiments, but that's not available uh, to consumers or even to doctors, as far as I know. Am I wrong about that? Yeah. No, I bet the, the pharmaceutical companies are building other things that are like that. As a matter of fact, the group at Johns Hopkins, um, they have a drug. They've modified Don a little bit. It's the same drug, but they've kind of they might be able to patent that. And it's under clinical well, trials. Is, is that three 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 bromopyruvate? No, no, three bromopyruvate is a, a glycolysis inhibitor. Um, so you don't have to worry about. I mean, you can use three bro. It's very toxic though. The only problem with three yes. BP is it's got a lot of toxicity. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so you, what, I mean, you, we you have get, a drug, so the, met, metformin. I mean, metformin would block the uptake of glucose to a certain degree, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's not that effective. You uh -huh. know, um, I tried all this stuff. You, you know, uh -huh. it's it's OK. I'm not going to say people shouldn't take it. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not it's not your earth. It's not your, your earth. It's uh -huh. not your prime over. Um, we know what works. Uh, we know how to work the system. It's a it's a strategy, and we published it in the press pulse uh, concept. Uh, could, where you we talk, could you explain the press pulse concept, please? Yeah, the press pulse. Well, that there was Aaron's um, a, a, a paleobiologist actually come up. 
He said the, uh, the eradication of organisms on the planet always happened when you have two unlikely events happening at the same time. And basically, uh, and this was the responsible for these mass uh, extinctions that we had in Earth's pre- prehistory. Um, so you have, a, you have some sort of a chronic stress on a population. It's, it's strong enough to weed out the weak, but the stronger organisms kind of hang on. And then you have some sort of catastrophic pulse, like a meteor strike or a volcano explosion, or and it, and it wipes out everything. So you you all you already have a weakened system by a chronic stress, uh, and then you wipe out the whole system with a with an acute pulse. So what what we do is we just simply adopt adopted that concept to the management of cancer. So what we do is we take humans and mice and whatever, and we bring them into a new metabolic state as a, and we put chronic stress on the tumor. And as you said, Ralph. You can't kill all the tumor cells by just taking away glucose because some of them will will hang on using glutamine. Uh-huh. So the, the concept of, of bringing the body into a new state is we remove systemic inflammation, which is important for driving the tumor with the, with the, with the uh, press uh, calorie-restricted ketogenic diet. We call it ketogenic metabolic therapy. The patient starts getting really healthy, but the tumor cells are hanging around. They're, they're not like all going, they're not dropping dead all over. And then we come in with glutamine inhibitor. So when the patient is in therapeutic ketosis, high, glu- high low glucose, elevated ketones, you then come in with the drugs and low doses. You don't have to be these high doses because once the patient is in therapeutic ketosis, we showed that these drugs work even better at lower dosages. You just need a little bit more to, to chronically, uh, to uh, acutely kill off the survivors. And uh, you do this without harm to the patient. It, uh, the toxicity is, is minimal, if, if at all. And you just gradually uh, degrade these tumors, switching from uh, from chronic stress to pulse stress and back and forth. And the next thing you know, um, either the tumor shrinks to very small levels or, or, or it disappears completely. And and we've seen this in so many people. They say, where is the clinical trials on this? Well, you can't do a double blind crossover on pulse press. Um, you want to you wanna live <laughs> or, or you want to be part of a clinical trial? So... Uh, um, you know, it's a, it's your choice. I mean, I I don't. I mean, it's up to people. Mm-hmm. Yes, but but again, I'll come back to the question of how do you attack the 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 glutamine source? Because again, the DON or the Don, I couldn't find a source for that, and I don't know. I've seen some I've seen some writings on the internet yeah. saying that maybe these anti worm medications, mebendazole and fen- yeah. fenbendazole. Uh, might right. act as, as as inhibitors of glutamine. Also, I've seen some indication, and I had some confirmation of this, that Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski's antineoplastons might act yeah. as as blockers of glutamine uptake. But what, practically speaking, and I'm sure that 90% of our listeners are in one way or another dealing with cancer or have it in somebody in the family or, or want to prevent recurrence, Practically speaking, how do you do this? I mean, is there a diet that people could use other other than this the fasting? But is there something yeah. that practical that people can do to be able to attack the the sources? In, in other words, is to quote from Jane McClellan's uh, book: Is there really a way to starve the cancer cell? Yeah. Well, you're right about the glutamine issue and Don. Um, you know, there are a number of companies came and will produce Don. Um, it's hard to get, um, it has to be delivered IV intravenous as well. So you, mm-hmm. you, you, it's a little bit more, not that, the, you know, physicians do intravenous treatment all the time. I mean, this is not a, not a medically difficult situation. Yeah. The problem is Don is not, is not, a, um, approved. I, I, I don't even want to say it's not improved because it had been used pr- pr- uh, prior to on, pe- on people with, uh, cancer. There are some, um, you know, many, many studies published where, where Don was used, but it was never used together with targeting the glucose. Uh, but you're 100 percent right. You know, where do you get this? There are a number of companies in China that make Don. The problem is I, I, I validated, you know, whether whether all these all the products from these companies are, 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 are good or not. I mean, you have to do it. I do it on a preclinical system before I recommend it for anybody. I mean, we get the drug from from Sigma Scientific Corporation. I mean, if I had cancer, I mean, I would get it from Sigma or someplace. 
Um, but is it, it's so, against the law. It's against the yeah, law. Yeah, to, listen, you want to, you want to keep your ass alive? I mean, who cares? Yeah. I mean, right? I mean <laughs> you, 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 you have to be practical about it. I mean, we have evidence. I mean, we, we already showed that when you administer the drug with the ketogenic diet, we delivered two to threefold more drug through the blood-brain barrier when it was administered with the ketogenic diet. I mean, give me a break. I mean, they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out all the ways to get through blood-brain barrier. You just put it on a ketogenic... And we did it with a different kind of a drug, too. So ketogenic diets facilitate transmission of small molecules into the brain to, to target brain cancer. It's just that simple. Yeah, mm -hmm. we published it. We published this. Now, what's the, yeah. oh, what's the mechanism? We don't know. But, but, the, but the bottom line is we've quantitated using uh, mass spectrometry to show that there is more drug going through the blood-brain barrier. Um, so you don't need the high doses that you used to need to, to get in there, right? So it's a, that's why I'm saying press pulse works as a beautiful synergistic interaction between uh, the different kinds of therapies. Um, you're right. Now, there are a number of drugs that the pharmaceutical industries are producing trying to mimic the effects of Don. Okay, there's uh -huh. a CB833, or they, they got these numbers for, them, for uh -huh. these things. Um, I'm not sure if they're as powerful as Don. And as I said, the Johns Hopkins, Hopson, uh, John, Johns Hopkins group is doing a lot of work on a Don-type analog. Um, I think these will come. Um, the problem is they, they just use that. So they go out and do a clinical trial using just the glutamine inhibitor, and they say, well, you know, it's marginally effective. Well, you're not targeting the glucose, man. You got to target yeah. both. What's the matter? And then they say, well, we can't do that because we won't know if it's our drug that works or whether it's this that works. And, and, and we're interested in keeping people alive without toxicity. Well, we're not interested. The same old, so, re the same old reductionism of we have to study I mean, one thing at a time, and it may yeah, be a well, synergy between different things. Yeah, well, see, we have the we've developed here at Boston College the single best series of animal models for cancer, systemic metastatic cancer, glioblastoma, all natural. These things are not these genetically engineered things that are right. artificial. Not this xenograft taking human cells and growing them on the ass of a mouse. I mean, this kind of stuff is is you know it's not natural stuff. I mean, not to say that these are the are, are bad models. They just don't provide. Uh, you don't, you want a model system that's going to replicate what goes on in the human, okay? And this is what we have. So we know that the model systems that we have, when it, when we see it working in these in these and these mice that we develop, we know it's going to work in humans, and we have seen it uh, do this. The problem now is what we do to keep mice alive as long as we can are very difficult to do these experiments in in clinical trials. Uh, only because we we you know we have a, a press diet and we pulse with drugs at certain uh, frequencies, um, and you know to do a people know what they're I mean it's hard to do a double blind on these kinds of things. So uh, um, you know so but the bottom line is if you have historical controls like GBM where most of the people are dead within two years, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, glial glioblastoma. Yeah, uh, glioblastoma. And, and and if you have guys that are living five and six years on metabolic therapy, then you might want to figure out what the hell, why, why are they doing so well? We have Pablo Kelly over in England. He's now six years out with no, no radiation, no chemo, just metabolic therapy. Um, we have other people, Andrew Scarborough. We're getting numbers of people, Alison Gannett. More and more people are coming uh, on board uh, because they want to stay alive. You know, and I wrote a big paper uh, clearly with, with uh, Joe Maroon, team surgeon for the Pittsburgh Steelers and neurosurgeon at UPIT, um, showing that the standards of care for glioblastoma are largely responsible for the rapid recurrence and demise of the patients. Um, you, shouldn't you, ever irradiate the brain. you shouldn't irradiate per people's brains. I already showed it creates a, a fusion hybridization and sends these tumor cells out. The use of Avastin or Bevacizumab should be banned. Uh, this is a drug that that contributes to the, yet they use it all the time. It contributes to massive invasion through the brain. And um, temozolomide, you know, it, it's it's like, what are you doing to these people? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can uh, manage these cancers so much better on metabolic therapy. But my colleagues in the field are yoked. They can't do it. They won't, they're not allowed to treat patients with metabolic therapy until all other therapies do, are shown not to work. And I'm saying, well, you know your damn therapy is not going to work, so why don't you come up from, oh, we can't do that. The IRB won't allow us to do that. And they're, we're, we're yoked. So these poor folks, the, the patients are, are, are trapped in a system 
that's a failed system putting their lives at risk for the maintenance of, of procedures that don't work. It's like it's a tragedy, monumental tragedy. Yes. And we, we hear a lot about ketogenic diet, but I think from the, certainly from the time that you wrote uh, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, you were always saying uh, it's not just ketogenic diet, it's also calorie restriction. But that's a lot harder, a lot harder for people. I mean, unless they're, they, they, their back is against the wall, the idea of combining the the cutting back on their food. We're such a consumer society that we like to take things as opposed to telling well, people well, ha- do less. It, 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 but it has to do with the species. In, in the mouse, um, when we when we fed the mice ketogenic diets ad libitum, that means unrestricted, and we had a ketogenic diet that they liked, uh, they would scarf it down, they would get insulin insensitivity, and the tumors would grow much faster. So we would have to uh, calorie restrict this. Human beings um, naturally calorie. The, 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 the hormone cholecystokinin is an anti-appetite um, uh, hormone. It's the, it, it stimulates the, eighth, uh, the tenth cranial nerve to shut down appetite. So when you eat a, a bunch of fat, all, oftentimes humans just don't stay, they stop eating. This is why the ketogenic diet is a weight loss diet. So yeah. people are eating ketogenic diets, they're losing weight. And they say, how can I lose weight by eating all this fat? Because you turn it on cholecystokine and shut down your appetite. So that happens more in humans than it does. Humans do a hell of a lot better on this than the mice do. Um, so, you know, we have to be very careful in the mice eating too much ketogenic diet. Whereas in humans, they don't eat much. They And they have a lot of good food sources, very nutritional uh, avocados and different kinds of, of, of mm-hmm. uh, food. That have that have high fat content, low carbohydrate content, and you just measure your glucose ketone index. And this this is what we also developed here at Boston College was the the glucose ketone index. So it allows people to know uh, the ratio of blood sugar to blood ketones to know whether or not they're in therapeutic ketosis. And this can vary from one person to the next. So some guy might eat one thing and get into ketosis. Another guy might eat something very different, get into the same ratio. It's when you're in that ratio is when the chronic stress goes onto the tumor cells. And once you're in therapeutic ketosis, yeah, then you go on, you take a drug that will target the glutamine and uh, you work it that way. And I think this is going to be the, the future. This is what I just told you is the future. It's just, it may take uh, people screaming and kicking to go into it. But, you know, bottom line is people want to live. That's it. I mean, that's it, it, sure. it's motivation for life. I mean, let's, yes. let's be honest. So the ketones, the ketone bodies, as they're, as they're called, these are just, just to explain for the, the lay um, listener, these are chemicals that are produced in the body when there's a when they, there's an absence of uh, carbohydrates for the generation of energy. So the body has a, a fallback mechanism, right, to produce yes. these ketones. Now you're saying that they, that not only uh, do these serve as an alternative uh, source of fuel for normal cells, but that they're actually toxic to cancer cells. How does that happen? Well, when, what, what, what we think is that they generate reactive oxygen species in the tumor cells and the, and the ROS kills them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all we know is that we, we and others have tried to grow cancer cells uh, in ketones and they die. And all, not only ketones, fatty acids as well. Uh, if you, you cannot, uh, cancer cells need glucose and glutamine. You can't, uh, fatty acids and ketones cannot replace glucose and glutamine. And even uh, what we find is even in the presence of glucose and glutamine, the ketone bodies can be toxic to the tumor cells. I now, you, you have to have a good, uh, normal cells burn ketone. We evolved as a species. In fact, we, as, as a human species, we evolved to starve. Our history on the planet has been one of constant starvation. <laughs> um, so we, we have adopted, uh, we have selected in our genomes incredible means of storing energy. We store energy in the form of, of, of fat, but we also burn. We, you know, our history was not at, at McDonald's hamburgers and and, and uh, Taco Bell and all these other things that were pounded in. And, and the obesity epidemic is only the result of our incredible uh, history of being able to store energy. So uh-huh. um, we're in a new a new environment now, which is which is producing us producing type two diabetes, obesity, cancer, all these other kinds of diseases. 
uh, based on our incredible ability to store energy because we evolved over millions of years as a starved species. Nobody was really fat. Um, yeah. You get your you get your fat from bone eating bone marrow um, uh, or sweet maybe during a p- particular periods of the season when you have a a, a, a a ripe fruit or a berry or something. But our 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 ability to survive was based on 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 burning fats and fats uh, themselves are broken down to ketone bodies because the brain can't can only use ketones or glucose it cannot use fatty acids so in order to keep our brain functional when we're not taking in carbs we burn fat the fat goes to the liver and the liver makes ketone bodies which are small water soluble fat breakdown products and they can provide the brain with all the energy that we need um so so but the t- you have to have a good mitochondria in in the cell to burn the ketones for energy and we now know that all cancer cells have defective mitochondria. They can't burn the ketones. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and they can't use fatty acids either. You need a good mitochondria to generate energy from fatty acids. So what cancer cells do is they store fatty acids. They form these little droplets. And in fact, if you look at under the electron microscope at tumor cells, and even sometimes under the light, light, you see all these vacuoles, these storage vacuoles. And you're saying, what the hell is going on? They're storing the fats because that's the way to protect them. They protect themselves because the fats will kill them if if, if they try to go into the they'll cause oh. too many reactive oxygen species. So they so store the are, fat in these little in these little grant and these little vacuoles in the cells. It's they're called iso- trium- isolating. They're sort yeah. of isolating the fat. So yeah, in this sense, you it, maybe I misread Jay McClellan's uh, thesis, but it seems as if one of the ways that she maybe disagreed with you was. Um, emphasizing that cancers need fatty acids, um, if I read her correctly, and we did an interview yeah, with yeah. her. No, I, well, it, this, yeah, this is a kind of a, not true. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's, it, it, it appears that way, that cancers need fatty acids. The, the issue is that the fatty acids stimulate glutaminolysis and glycolysis. Can you believe this? Uh-huh. So yeah. we showed, we have a paper coming out. So it, it looks like, oh yeah, cancer cells need fatty acids. Well, the fatty acids aren't used by the cancer cell directly. The fatty acids stimulate the tumor cells to take up more glucose and glutamine, so it's an indirect effect of the fatty acids. I so, see. Um, so yeah, so a lot of you'll see a lot of papers published in the in the literature saying, "Oh yeah, fatty acids are used by the tumor cells, and they're sucking down glucose and glutamine." Well, you take away the glucose and glutamine and give them the fatty acids and see what happens. They croak. Um, uh, so a lot of people don't do the right kinds of experiments. Uh, they think tumor cells have normal respiration when they don't. Um, because if you look under the electron microscope, they, they have no cristae, the mitochondria all screwed up. They're not going to be able to burn fatty acids or ketones. People have to mm-hmm. come to realize that. Otherwise, the ketogenic diet should make tumors grow 10 times faster. They don't. Yes. So um, basically, uh, all cancers are defective or in, in terms of the mitochondria, uh, which are the energy producing elements within the cell. And uh, if I remember um, our our mutual friend Pete Peterson at Johns Hopkins, uh, who wrote the introduction to your book, uh, saying that uh, on average cancer cells have half as many mitochondria as normal cells. So it's basically yeah. what what you've sort of gone back to Otto Warburg, nineteen twenty four. Uh, basically locating the origin of cancer in the mitochondria. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, it, it, the thing about uh, Otto uh, Warburg and his colleagues is they were focused. He, he His argument was that all cancer cells ferment glucose because their oxidative phosphorylation is defective. And uh, people then went off and said, oh, but all these cancer cells are taking in oxygen and making, and making ATP in the mitochondria. Therefore, Warburg must be wrong. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we have found is that the energy coming out of the mitochondria, the few mitochondria that might be present in cancer, is not coming from oxidative phosphorylation. It's coming from mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, driven by glutamine and through the glutaminolysis pathway. Warburg did not know about this only because that mechanism was not d- discovered until the very end of his life or the, uh, uh, towards mm-hmm. the end of his career. Um, and, and even Warburg himself made the era of thinking that, uh, that when tumor cells take in oxygen, that that oxygen is producing ATP 
through oxidative phosphorylation in the in the um, electron which transport, is, which it, which to explain is the normal method by yeah. which cell yeah. cell you know, normal yeah. cells produce energy. Right, all of it. We're breathing. Everybody's breathing, um, yeah. and and we breathe because we need the uh, oxygen as the f- final acceptor for the electrons in the electron transport chain, so we can generate ATP. Mm-hmm. Um, but the cancer cells, if you look at them in culture. You say, wow, look at these cancer cells. They're taking in oxygen just as much as a normal cell. Therefore, they must have normal oxphos. Uh, wrong. We showed this. They're taking in oxygen using it for different reasons. Others, other scientists have shown this as, to, as well. So where the hell are they getting their energy from? So they're getting their energy from glutamine. It's coming through and it's making massive energy in the TCA cycle. It's a substrate level phosphorylation. Here's another thing, Ralph, which has been recently found, that many tumor cells have the pyruvate kinase M2 isoform in the cytoplasm. They don't, in other words, you're not get. it doesn't make ATP. It, it, you can make lactic acid, but you're making metabolites for growth, but you're not making ATP. Without ATP energy- being the, the main source of, yeah, yeah, of, energy. of packets of energy, right? Energy is energy. You, you can't live without, nothing on the planet can live without energy. Cancer cells can't live with energy. We can't. You you drink cyanide. Let's see how how long you live when you drink cyanide. You shut down the whole system. You die. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So so where the hell are the cancer cells getting their energy from? If it's if it's not through glycolysis and it's not through elect, uh, the electron transport chain, where the hell are these cells getting their energy to live? It comes from mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation. That's why when you target glutamine. And you've taken away glucose; these cells drop dead fast, and you can do that. And this this is the new thing. The new thing that people don't understand is that the cancer cells are getting the majority of their energy from mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, giving the appearance that they might be using oxidative phosphorylation, but they're not. Mm-hmm. Cancer cells can grow in cyanide. We can't grow in we can't live in cyanide. Why the hell is a cancer cell living in cyanide? Because it's fermenting. It's fermenting. Yes. It's not using, you know. So it doesn't. It doesn't need oxygen. No, doesn't need oxygen at all. Right. Right. So, um, and Warburg showed that, and uh, he sh- he poured cyanide on his tumor, so couldn't believe it, you know. So, uh, I mean, you have a person with metastatic cancer, and they drop dead of a heart attack. I mean, their body is dead, but the tumor cells in that body are still alive. They'll be alive for maybe a couple of days. Mm. So, mm. Uh, as long as yeah. they can get fermentable fuel. Amazing. So the takeaway, the takeaway message here is that it is possible to control cancer by controlling the, the, fuel, the food supply basically to the cancer. And the main things to worry about would be glucose, meaning uh, carbohydrates that would turn into um, increased blood glucose, and glutamine, which is the uh, common free amino acid. Is there is there some other than fasting? Is there some diet that would minimize the amount of glutamine that's available? No, but glutamine glutamine can be made from other sources. So it's really mm-hmm. it's that's why they call it a non essential amino acid. You can make mm-hmm. glutamine from glucose. However, when you're mm-hmm. shutting down glucose, you're also restricting, and at least in the brain, you're also going to be cutting a little bit back on the glutamine. But glutamine is such an big uh, um, ubiquitous amino acid, like everywhere, and it's also mm-hmm. involved. It's it's extremely important for the urea cycle, as as Hans Krebs showed. Uh, it's extremely important for the function of our immune system. Our um, the the new scums from from Oxford University in England showed that uh, glutamine is the main fuel for cells of our immune system. We also know um, so you at, for our gut uh, mm-hmm. health. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of cancer mm-hmm. patients are given high dose glutamine to help repair and the damage to their body. Yes. Yes. So, um, so it's, it has a double-edged sword on that molecule. You've got to be careful because at yeah. the same time we need the molecule, we also know it's driving our cancer. So, um, and people now need to know, and there's no diet that I know of that will restrict glutamine. So it's got to be a, that's why we use press pulse. The diets are okay for shutting down glucose, but then we mm-hmm. have to use certain low dose drugs to work together for this, mm-hmm. uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy using press pulse strategy. Now, what would those drugs be? Well, those, you know, like I said, Don, and the, listen, believe me, the pharmacy, here's the situation. You can't patent Don um, because it's, it's, it's a pan, 
what I mean by it's a pan glutaminase inhibitor. So it inhibits multiple glutaminases simultaneously. What the, what the big companies would like to do is produce a drug that would do what Don can do. Um, the problem is they haven't been successful yet in developing that kind of a drug. Uh, and mm-hmm. many of the drugs that they have tried are toxic. They're too toxic. Mm-hmm. So, um, but believe me, this, I would say that looking for the glutamine inhibitor that's non-toxic is probably one of the big hidden secrets of the pharma, of the cancer pharmaceutical. I mean, obviously they're using all these immunotherapies and CAR T that's, that's, that's nuts too. It's in my mind because it's based on the somatic mutation theory. And we know that the somatic mutation theory is now, is now, uh, under serious reevaluation. So you have to have you have to have therapies that are based on the underlying biological problem of the disease. I mean, I'm not saying that immunotherapy, PDL1 inhibitors and CAR T immunotherapy and these kinds of things don't work on, on some people, but they kill people too. They're very expensive. They can be incredibly toxic. So why are you doing that when you don't need to do it? You know, this is the, this is the crazy thing that I can't find. I mean, what are you mm-hmm. doing? You understand the biology of the problem? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing all that nonsense? You know, it's like, give me a break. Well, I mean, uh, the the drugs are phenomenally profitable, eight point eight billion for Keytruda last year, um, but they're being uh, given at a much too high a level. If you reduce the dose to about a third of what's currently being done, you don't lose any of the effectiveness. In fact, you increase the effectiveness and you reduce the serious side effects to about one tenth the level of what's currently existing. So it's a money driven thing, but there is some truth. There is some truth to the fact that you can mobilize the immune system. But um, I mean, for me, the the takeaway message is what you just said. When most people, of course, they're focused on what can they do now vis-a-vis their own cancer. But it's also, you know, we can't say Albert St. George used to say, you can't really, uh, you can't really solve a problem that you don't understand. You can't cure a disease that you don't understand. And so uh, the understanding is that 95, whatever percent of scientists believe that cancer is a genetic disease. And, and that's in fact, it's almost like written stone over the entrance to the National Cancer Institute. I mean, they literally, it's the first sentence of one of the big texts of the NCI. You started or you accelerated a movement to understand cancer not as a genetic disease but as a metabolic disease and where the focus isn't on the nucleus and the and the genome but the focus is on the the cytoplasm and specifically on the mitochondria within the cytoplasm i think that's a revolutionary event and you are you are the person who's mainly in modern times mainly responsible for that i would say and that's a tremendous achievement. So it's uh, it's it's really well, a pleasure to talk to you because it's really like you you started something here that I think could really result in a complete reconceptualization of the cancer problem. Yeah, well, I think that's true. And and um, you know, I've I've I mean, we did the nuclear transfer experiments. I I didn't do those, but I I, I put them together in one in one big uh, for the first time, uh, yeah. putting them all together. Um, where everybody could see the commonality in, in, in replacing bad mitochondria with good mitochondria and managing the cancer, regardless of the mutations in the nucleus. And, and then we went on. Now, new, new papers are coming out showing that there are some cancers that have no mutations, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, the new, the new stuff is coming out showing that you have all these driver mutations in normal cells that never develop cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have the chimpanzee, our closest biological relative, 98, uh, almost 99% identical in genome and protein sequence. And there's never been a documented case of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee. Um, yet they're genetically the same as we are. So, um, you know, y- you put that together and you say, oh, wow, we have cancer cells that have no mutations. We have normal cells with driver mutations. We have chimpanzees that never get cancer. And you say to yourself, I mean, how in the hell are you able to say that cancer is a genetic disease? It makes absolutely no sense. And, and you know, anybody who wants to sit down and think about that comes to, you have to, if you have a rational thinking mind, you have to come to the conclusion there's no way in hell cancer can be a genetic disease. Um, 
So we put it all together and now we realize, and, and, and without energy, these tumor cells can't live. Where do they get their energy from, from fermentation? What drives fermentation? Glucose and glutamine. Well, why don't we focus on the glucose and glutamine issue? And when you do, you get, you get results that are much better than anything that's currently being used in the, in the yeah. cancer industry. It's, I have it's, one, not, it's not, it's not I that have complicated. More, I have one more question for you, which has always been on my mind. And that is that, um, you know, Thompson, Craig Thompson, who's the president of Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, is also in this field, sort of, in the, in terms of glutamine and metabolism. And they, uh, he and uh, his uh, and Memorial Sloan Kettering patented a glutamine PET scan, uh, but they never com- they never commercialized it. They have the patent on it, and I'm not I'm not making conspiracy theories here. I'm sure they must have run into different problems and so forth. But my question is this, if you had, if if they would ever develop the glutamine PET scan, in other words, to see where there was increased glutamine uptake the way they can see whether there's increased glucose uptake, what do you think it would show? I mean, do you think that cancers are predominantly, tumors are predominantly uh, glucose uh, uh, utilizing machines and not glutamine, or do you think that a lot of tumors are doing both increased uptake of glucose and glutamine, or are are some tumors, as I suspect, some tumors are mainly just dependent on glutamine? For instance, cancers that are growing and don't light up on a PET scan, pretty much you can assume, right, that those are going to be turned out to be glutamine dependent. But where's the line? Is it is it that could you? For in other words, what I'm asking is. Theoretically, do you think it would be possible if you could severely cut down on the amount of glucose going to the tumor through the various means that exist to bypass the glutamine question entirely? Yeah, I mean, these are very important questions. And the the, the answer is that it, it depends on the cell. Um, some Some tumors will be more glutamine dependent and others will be more glucose dependent. But the, but in my in my mind, uh, both fuels are used. Uh, we have some tumors here that are more glutamine dependent than glucose dependent, and we have just the reverse on some other tumors. And that I think is what the uh, is what the cancer field has already has already determined that you have um, oftentimes there's very few tumors that we know of that are purely glucose or purely glutamine dependent. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, tumors that have mutations. In the TCA cycle, which in other words block or disrupt the the, the the glutaminolysis pathway indirectly, forcing that cell now to use more glucose, um, they become more glucose dependent. Uh-huh. Um, but majority, but majority of the uh, here, here's the situation: we have two things. The glucose is primarily the carbons of glucose are serving as the building blocks for the synthesis of proteins and amino acids and lipids and these kinds of things, so the cells can grow. The energy that drives the process is primarily coming from glutamine through the mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, as well as the glutamine nitrogen. The nitrogen is needed for DNA and RNA and protein synthesis. So the, the amide nitrogen on glutamine is used as a precursor um, for growth, along with the carbons of glucose. So the carbons of both of these molecules are distributed through the cell for the rapid growth synthesis of the various building blocks that they need, DNA and RNA and protein mm-hmm. synthesis. So it's a combination of, of, of needing both fuels for the proliferation of that cell. And, and I look at it as an, a purely energy because every cell uh, has a pump on the membrane surface. It's called the sodium potassium ATPase. It burns ATP in order to keep a gradient of ions across the membrane. And that allows the cell to be alive. And life means you're, you're, uh, you're not at equilibrium. And to remain to, uh, away from equilibrium, you need energy. And when the energy to the pumps fail, the cell swells and dies. Okay? It's not that complicated. Uh-huh. So where the hell is the energy coming to maintain the pump activity? Whether you're a cancer cell, a brain cell, any kind of a cell, you need to maintain the activity of the pump. So it's all energy. So if I pull the plug on the energy, the pumps will, will not get the ATP and they'll fail and they'll kill. So the cell, the tumor cell is dependent on glutamine for energy and, uh, and glucose for growth. So you pull the plug simultaneously on glucose and glutamine 
and the problem becomes manageable. But yes. yet there's not a single clinical trial anywhere on the planet that's simultaneously targeting glucose and glutamine. It's unbelievable. You're it's unbelievable. unbelievable. It is. It is. Well, listen, I hope we can continue this discussion some point in the future. And I tremendously appreciate you coming on the podcast. And I'm sure that the, the listeners will, too. Talking to uh, Professor Thomas Seyfried of Boston College, who's done the remarkable work of showing how cancers are dependent on glucose and glutamine for energy and how that could be used uh, as an effective cancer treatment. So th thank you so much, Tom, for, for agreeing to be on the, on the show. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph. Real pleasure.